back to the Fight Sites MMA podcast. My name is Daniel Martin, and I'm here with my co-host, M. Night Shyamalan. And today we are joined with a very special guest who I am have been so been looking forward to talking with this guy over Skype and podcasting with him. Uh, he is, I've said on Twitter, the most interesting man in the world. Sir, you agree? Of course I do. In fact, people have many names for him. That he has all over his Twitter bio, which is Keynesian welfare status, economist, destroyer of Western civilization, corporate hack. Uh, he goes by many names. He is, in fact, the greatest of all time. We are, of course, talking about the one, the only, Hacks Arised. Hacks, how are you doing, my man? Uh, you know, the uh, the family is playing around with band practice. I have like a a young girl child smashing away at drums with like you know bad <laughs> technique. I've got my own little Tony Ferguson going, so it's a good time for this cast. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, I mean, it could be it worse is. in quarantine, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? Maybe like just some unending dysrhythmic. Is, uh, exactly what we need to underscore this discussion about to this week's fighter of interest, which is of course Tony Ferguson. Um, I know Serum and I, we, <laughs> we teased last week that we were going to talk about Whitaker, but you know it, once again, we went back on our word and decided to do something different. And you know what? You can't tell us otherwise because that we have no schedule. <laughs> yeah, if you trust our word at this point, you're just, I'm sorry to say, you deserve to be fired from your job. We are working with very little uh, in the MMA and combat sports world. But like I said, it makes it fun, it makes it like a little bit liberating, and we get to have guys like Hacks on to discuss uh, fighters of interest and fights of interest. So I'm excited. Uh, I think that's really the only thing we have on tap this week, um, but I think that it's going to last us maybe a good hour because there is quite a bit to uh, analyze and dissect and discuss about uh, the career of Tony Ferguson. So Hacks... You are a big Tony Ferguson fan yourself. What is it about El Kukui that he just does not seem to take a loss for whatever reason? I think, I mean, I'm of the opinion that if you want to grow as a fighter and an analyst, you have to be on the lookout for fighters that your value system and your like way of deconstructing combat sports doesn't understand. And, like, you guys know that uh, my way of thinking about mixed martial arts comes from a very technical Eastern European background, build your offense behind the jab, have a fundamentally solid takedown defense. And Tony Ferguson in that context makes zero fucking sense whatsoever. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, he'd, if he'd grown up with some of the coaches I grew up with, they would have beat his ass 24-7. And yet, despite all of those, um, I'm not going to say technical shortcomings, but despite all of these uh, seeming technical flaws, I think Tony Ferguson might have the the, the uh, biggest galaxy brain understanding of offense and mixed martial arts that's ever existed. Um, he's a guy who I think it's always good to contrast him with uh, Khabib because they've never fought, but also because they're so... There's such great contrast. Tony is a guy who sees the big picture of how to win a mixed martial arts fight, but doesn't know what the words consistent process mean on how to get there. And Khabib is somebody who has a very consistent process, but I think if you took him outside the lightweight division and made him fight in an environment that wasn't strategically and tactically to his favor of grinding guys against the cage, he'd look lost. I think you could take Tony and put him in middleweight and he'd show you how to win. He might get his head blasted off because of his defensive holes, but he'd know what to do. Yeah, I think very, very aptly put. Um, I think I agree. And that's that's kind of something I think we should frame the discussion with, um, which is that you don't have to be technically standard um, to succeed in MMA. I think this is one of the, the sort of mercurial elements of mixed martial arts as a sport is that you can have guys who are you know get some of the get some of the big picture as you said get the concepts like you know another there's a strange comparison but dominic cruz is someone who is he is not a good mechanical puncher by any means he's not you know, his footwork does have a lot of flaws he he takes himself out of position quite willingly um 
but he's also someone who has a genuine a genuinely masterful understanding of positioning and cage craft and distance and um like kind of hair triggers if you will uh and tony ferguson is you know there are there are mechanical issues there are tactical issues and there are even some strategic issues but as you said he is he is an incredibly apt fighter in the moment like he is he is very good at understanding exchanges and like you said he just he just knows how to win fights yeah i think it's something that kind of has to be underscored moving forward in a conversation where i think as uh danny said both me and danny aren't the most optimistic about tony moving forward but with all the flaws that we might point out, it's important to note how philosophically different Tony is as a fighter just constructed from the ground up. Because as Hacks mentioned, it's not like, yeah, he does have a jab. And as we move forward, it's quite a good one. But it's not like the kind of, you know, stay defensively responsible behind it kind of jab. It's like every part of his game is built to, with a specific purpose in mind. It's just not the purpose which we might expect it to have. So it's like, for example, as you mentioned, it's not necessarily that it's mechanically right or wrong. It's just very different. And like fighters like Yaya Rodriguez show how different and bad can work. And Tony Ferguson is not different and bad. He's different and good in a different way. At least he used to be. I, I think there's something to be said. I mean, I talk about this a lot to you guys. Uh, MMA fans don't know what the fuck institutions mean. Because the majority of MMA fans don't have a deep understanding of like gyms and institutions and so on. It's not that they're stupid. It's that this sport is new, right? Like a lot of people who came from MMA and were watching the, uh, the development of the, the Wilder Fury fight, a lot of people were going, well, he's going to Kronk Gym. They've never taught, you know, Kronk Gym doesn't have the defensively minded background that Fury does. Very superficial analysis. And then Fury came out and fought a beautiful fight against Wilder that was basically, I have these incredible defensive fundamentals. I'm training with a bunch of guys who have enhanced my ability, focused my ability to use those defensive fundamentals to walk down this nuclear bomb attached to a spindly right arm and beat the shit out of him. So the, Tony is very much his own person. He has his own camp. He does his own thing. He takes his own approach. And I really wonder if he uh, trained at a gym like at and I suspect the gym would have beaten that uniqueness out of him and we would have gotten uh, a much less interesting and effective fighter. They would have said, well, this guy isn't the tier of athlete that can, you know, be a championship threat. Um he does a lot of things that break very basic stances. He has this jab that, you know, should be doing all kinds of work, but he mostly uses it as a way to make the other go, go, what the fuck is going on? He's never going to go anywhere. But Tony studies at his own pace, in his own environment, with his own game plan, and has found a way to make his tools work for him. I mean, the, the jab is another example. I think a lot of superficial analysis is like, wow, you know, if Tony had more defensive responsibility, his jab would be a great tool the whole way through contests. But something that always sticks out to me is in the early game, the early rounds, yes, there are a lot of technical flaws, but as Tony starts exhausting his man and everything about Tony's fight plan in every aspect is built around, how do I make the other guy suck win by the third round? People start reaching for that jab. They start like despairingly, you know, like holding their hands out like a villain in a Disney movie that's about to hit the ground because they've fallen off the bridge. They're like, how do I reach at this guy? And all of a sudden that jab starts really ruining people. Those uh, I, I, I almost loopy straight punches have them going, oh, God, what's going on? And then he snap downs them and it's over. Like, it, it's so strange that Tony's built his jab in a way that is perfect for getting to the end game. But at the start, he's like, I'm going to just throw this out of stance and get cracked. Yeah. I think you brought up a really good point about institutions in MMA. Um, and that's a that's a really interesting observation because I had a discussion last week with Ryan and we talked about uh, like what to look for in prospects. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about, like footwork and cage craft and those types of things, um, his point is that those specific traits are sometimes like if, if they are underdeveloped in a fighter a lot of it is you know something of a systemic problem because you have guys instead of sparring in the ring or the cage like there's a lot of guys 
you know, sparring at once in an open mat. And so they don't have to worry about like their positioning, you know, to the fence. They don't have to worry about what to do when they get cornered. And then you've got guys like Eddie Alvarez, you know, or Peter Yan, who are very consummate, you know, ring generals in MMA. But they got there because they had a lot of in-time experience in the cage. Like, you know, Peter Yan was fighting five rounds in his, like, fifth or sixth pro MMA fight. You know, Eddie Alvarez was, you know, fought in all different types of, you know, cages and rings all over the world for an extended amount of time. And they learn those things on the fly. I think Tony is someone who we can also look at who has has learned he's kind of learned to make his approach work as he's gone forward. Like I don't, there were a couple early fights from him where you could see him kind of, you know, working the kinks out a little bit, like the, um, the Mike Rio fight, the Kikuno fight and so forth. But then I think he has, he has developed more of a process as time has gone on. Um, I, you know, a lot of it is about leveraging that pace and leveraging that jab. Um, but it's almost like, it's almost like he's learned, as you pointed out, Hacks, to kind of ramp up his intensity. And that has, I think that is a trait that he has specifically learned through cage time. Would you agree? I think I think there's an element of that. I, I would also add two other observations. The first is that I, I'm of the opinion a lot of Tony's strikes are exceptionally disruptive. Uh, his jabs and straight punches out of stance, his front snap kick, and of course his elbows. For example, uh, as a comparison, when John Jones throws elbows, he's a lot better at getting behind them and closing the door, or you know he used to be until he started being bad. But um, <laughs> T Tony is incredible at throwing his elbow to disrupt the other guy's offense, and, and that's something that you kind of hit on in your uh, MMA defense and initiative meta game. There's kind of three or four ways to defend. There is to make the other guy afraid to throw or disrupt his process. And then there is various layers and stages of disrupting his attack on the way to you. And Tony's response is always, I'm going to fuck the other guy up. Like he doesn't think about defenses in, I don't want him to hit me. Or if he does, it's as part of an incoherent and often um, split type of system that doesn't build together into a whole. Like uh, his his slips and defensive adjustments against Barboza, they, there wasn't a coherent system. And, I, and from what I remember, when he did attempt head movement in that fight, it was kind of like, uh, well, I mean, now you're not punching him out of stance and terrifying him. But when Tony was like, actually, you know what? I don't care about your kicks. I don't care about your elbows. I don't care about your punches. I'm just going to beat your ass 24-7. Barboza couldn't establish any kind of rhythm he was like oh i'm gonna kick him oh god he stepped inside and elbowed me oh i'm gonna try and punch him in the face why is his head over in like iowa when i'm in new york state like he couldn't figure anything out whatsoever <laughs> yeah i think it's another interesting thing about his elbows is it kind of shows how he's been built you know like he's not unorthodox for the sake of being unorthodox he's unorthodox just as a function of how he's evolved as a fighter because one cool thing he did against Cerrone was he used the jab to draw out Cerrone's responses and just like immediately spun into an elbow and even guys that are good at spinning elbows a lot of them like Volkanovski they get into the clinch and spin out of there or John Jones he just kind of yeets them out whenever he wants to but it's built around a process that it's conventional in a boxing sense conceptually but it's also not like the first or the second or the third or the fourth counter i'd ever say you do when you jab and you draw a counter out of someone it's just it's weird in a very interesting way and it's i think the thing that you mentioned about tony's game kind of building because of just you know the sheer amount of offense i think one fight that's really instructive with that is the michael johnson fight because i think you could argue that like a super fast puncher in exchanges who can like who's super durable he might struggle with that kind of fighter at all times, but what made Tony's approach not work there was that Johnson was able to limit the exchanges a bit more than anyone could against this version of Tony. So then his actual tactical flaws reared their head more than they would with this current iteration, who's learned to leverage his offensive potency and just his sheer volume. I actually think the Venata fight was really interesting from that perspective because I know a lot of people treat Lando as a meme and he is a meme but it was kind of interesting That's to see Tony meme. in that fight is like oh this guy's just weaving constantly out of exchanges I'm not getting exchanges I want you can see Tony's internal process like this guy is beating me up 
oh, I love it. He's beating me up. This is the best thing ever. And then at some point, like, you just see the light come into Tony's brain. Well, he's limiting exchanges by getting under me. Why don't I just put all of my weight in his neck? And it, it's such a simple answer. There's nothing technical about it. It's just like, me put weight on neck, man, get slow. Me finish, man, zug, zug. But it's so beautifully Tony. Because, like, how, <laughs> how, many, how many fighters are just going to do that? Like, every other fighter in the, in the lightweight division except... A geishi, I think, would have just been like, oh, I need to find some kind of trick in my technical stable that would actually let me, you know, put weight on him. Like, even Khabib, I think, would have been like, I've, I've got to find a specific technique. Tony's like, fuck that. I'm just going to put my weight on his neck, YOLO. And it worked. I like, I, I don't think many fighters would have been in that bad a situation in the lightweight top 10 against Fanata. But I also don't think many fighters would have just been like, ah, screw it. Wait on the back, you know, snap down city time to get out of it. And that's like the definition of Tony. A lot of people are like, he always gets rocked and he always finds a way to win. True. My thesis supervisor uh, loved James Dean, the, the character. And there's a great movie, um, Rebel Without a Cause, with Chicken, where the, the young men are driving at each other with cars, trying to kill each other. You know, it's like that, oh, if you don't oh, yeah. pull away, I'll hit you. Oh, it's yeah. It's like a, a chicken game. And um, the, the, the metaphor we came up with is... Uh, Rafael Dos Anjos is driving a beautifully made car, European, all of the latest safety equipment. There's an ejection seat because he's he's such a technically minded pressure fighter. But the engine's a bit underpowered. If you can get him on the back foot, he's not so scary anymore. Khabib is driving a big, powerful car, a big, powerful engine. Very scary, very intimidating. But you'd be surprised how many options are actually there to get out of the way. Tony Ferguson is driving like some 1970s shit box with a jet engine strapped to the back. And he's not driving it from the front seat. He's driving it with his feet and an Xbox controller. It's painted red and he's laughing like a maniac the whole time. <laughs> oh, my God. That is that is the best visual. That is the best metaphor I've ever heard about Tony Ferguson. Um yeah, like I think I I think I pretty much agree with all that. Is that he's, it is kind of it's easy to look at Tony Ferguson and um, kind of pick apart the the details, if you will. Um, it's easy to look at him and in specific exchanges, and you can say, well, he's doing this incorrectly. Like that was a mistake. Um, you know, he's out of position here. Like he's you know his weights you know, he's completely leaning off his his rear hip here, but it's it's displaced or you know whatever. Um, but I think it is kind of the the concert of his pressure and his you know his his tendency to double down in exchanges that he doesn't like and his willingness to keep searching for answers even amidst all this chaos that makes him makes him who he is. Yeah, I think it's that it's hard to say that those things don't matter like at all because they clearly do. If you look at a fight like Pettis, if you look at a fight like Venata, even as Hacks mentioned. You're not going to find someone like Dustin Poirier or even Khabib uh, be in any trouble against Lando Venata for my money. It's just going to be, you know, they get inside and they beat him up. And Tony's problems in the small scale, they do matter with that. And, yeah, they could be better even keeping the kind of weird philosophical base that he has. It's just that it's been deceptively difficult to take advantage of that. And... I think, again, yeah, it comes down to just his game working as a whole in a way that many fighters, even their individual parts, don't work that well. So I I think it is worth discussing amongst the three of us what are, I mean, you know, hacks, if we're using your, <laughs> if we're using that description to, you know, to analyze Tony Ferguson, where are the cracks? Like, where do we see the issues in Tony Ferguson? Like, where where does he show his vulnerabilities? Because they are there. And, like, what kind of fighter would it take to really open those open those wounds up? You know, over time, we've seen him... We've seen him battle back from adversity against a lot of opponents. And we've seen him against a lot of different styles, which, you know, Hacks kind of relates to your point earlier, is that he he's someone who just gets this at a fundamental level, no matter who he seems to be fighting. But what are the things within his his technical toolbox that you're not crazy about, Hacks? I think it's less specific things in his technical toolbox and more, more two observations. Um, he's such a pace-based fighter, and he, he excels so much at exhausting people that I think some comparisons to Holloway and to the approach that was taken to beat Holloway by Poria, 
by uh, Volkanovsky is, is worth considering. The, the, the difference that I do think between Holloway and Ferguson is that Ferguson still has weapons in almost every category. Like, Max can throw effective kicks. Max does usually not throw effective kicks when his boxing is going well. Tony will throw whatever the fuck he wants at any given time for any given reason. So I think it's less about techniques for me, and it's more about qualities in the fighter that he's fighting. I don't have as high opinion of Poria's chances against Tony than you guys do because I think that when Poria is backed into a corner or things don't go well for him, he reverts to a number of specific techniques. I, I don't think it's so much specific technical weaknesses of Tony to open up on, although I really would like to see top-level fighters against him target his body. I think the defensive holes yeah. there are to do a lot of good body work. And I would also yep. like to see fighters crack him with real power on the end of clinch exchanges. Because Tony is so comfortable using his pace to smother, get him with a good shot on the end, and that might change how even he thinks. I, I for me, I like comparing him to the Volkanovski fight against Holloway. Tony's a pressure fighter who who lives on the thrill of that pressure to shut down threats. So is Max. Tony has more offensive options, I believe, in the sense that if he's not working with his boxing, if it's not working with his wrestling, he'll just throw kicks. Like he's more willing to go fuck the plan. I'm Tony Ferguson. So, what yeah. I would, so I, for me, it's less specific techniques. I would like to see a fighter that has the poise to do three things against Tony. The first thing is the willingness to step in on him, even if it gets you cracked, and hit him really damn hard, using the threat of their power to deny Tony favorable exchanges on the scorecard. I think that's really important. Secondly, I think somebody who could punctuate the beginning and the end of exchanges with uh, powerful body attacks and I think that the third thing for me is I, I would love to see a fighter willing to, when they uh, when, when there are pauses in, in Tony's pace and flow in fights, which aren't often, I would love to see some fighters just kind of stand in the center of the ring and be like, yeah, what? Because those three things kind of play off each other. It's a similar strategy to against Max, but I, I think there's more chaos involved that Tony Ferguson's going to bring. And I think you need a fighter who is very comfortable in a chaotic firefight. For me, this is why I feel like Dustin Poirier's chances against Tony, I probably don't rate them as high as you guys because I think Poirier falls back to a few preferred techniques when things get bad. For me, the, the fighter that I would say who has the right mentality to bring it is uh, Geishi. He has shown improved defensive sensibilities. He can target the body like a motherfucker. He's willing to throw those powerful slashing kicks, even if it might risk him getting hit, which I think is a, a risk worth taking against Tony because he doesn't have tremendous power. Um, and, and, you know, Geishi is prepared to really get some vicious infighting going. I think that's the right idea. A lot of ways in which Geishi can hit the body a lot of ways in which he can say, oh, you want to throw shit, crazy shit? I'll throw crazy shit, but I hit harder. And a willingness to go, I'm not afraid of your pace. I will initiate exchanges and hit you harder than you're hitting me. Yeah, I think that's a good way to approach it. I think that's why Gaethje is kind of more of a nightmare than I think you might say Poirier is. Because Poirier, in a way, he's kind of awful for Tony, in my opinion. And yeah, you mentioned that we probably estimate Poirier's chances against Tony higher than you do. But someone, you know, who can close distance on Tony, take advantage of his positioning on the counter, take advantage of his kind of porous defense in long combinations. As you mentioned, hitting the body, which is something that Poirier does very well. But yeah, it's one thing where Gaethje might be a bit less prone to mental breakage and that's something that I did really want to say about Poirier before the Khabib fight because you know before that the Holloway fight kind of made me think that Poirier might not be prone to that kind of thing anymore but he could theoretically be if Tony puts him through a really hard fight and like kind of freaks him out but yeah I think one thing about Tony is that the thing that hides his smaller issues is also something that exposes it and that's a weird thing to say because it seems kind of obvious is that Tony relies so much on volume that it gives guys a lot of opportunities. For example, I think if Tony kind of sat back on Pettis, kind of jabbed and pushed him back at a more like deliberate pace, he wouldn't have had the offensive success he had, but he wouldn't also have had the defensive shortcoming that he did at the beginning of round two if he hadn't just, you know, walked straight at Pettis and freaked him out and like, you know, gotten cracked. It's just, it's kind of the dichotomy of the volume fighter that I think 
is making Tony's flaws seem bigger than they are one, but also more significant than they should be. Yeah, I think that's well said. Um, I I do kind of wonder about that. I, I always kind of wonder about a Poirier-Ferguson fight because I, I think you're right, Hacks. I think that there is... When Poirier is... You know, if Poirier is in a fight that he feels is is uncomfortable, because at least with the Max fight, as violent and as, you know, as intense as it got, and while he did get hurt at several points in that fight, it was still his kind of fight. It was still a fight that he was, like, nominally comfortable in. The thing is, Ferguson kind of takes away all semblance of comfort when he's in a fight, because he's because he's just so difficult to read. Like you said, he's more willing to just say, okay, this isn't working, fuck it, I'm going to try something else. Um, and that makes him very difficult to read, but it also kind of puts him in, in, you know, specifically bad positions. I think that, like you said, Hacks, uh, someone who could really target his body would be challenging, but I also think someone who actually is at range parity with Ferguson, who might be able to, to hit straight shots down the middle from range, or, this is something I noticed in the Venata fight, is that Tony Ferguson is actually not... I don't think Tony Ferguson likes punching down at his opponents. I think when guys can get under him and start, like, you know, start bobbing and weaving and rolling with the shots, you know, if Venata had, like, was able to roll under Ferguson's Ferguson's long jab and then hit the body, like, he might have been able to win that fight. Um, like, it is... I think that is something that he is increasingly uncomfortable with. He doesn't like punching down. He sort of likes punching straight. He is a vertical... A, a unique, angular, and vertical targeting fighter. Uh, so Gaethje's always Gaethje's kind of the big one because I think Gaethje would not only is he willing to step in, but he'd be willing to push push Ferguson back. But I also think Poirier is someone who could potentially jab with Ferguson from range, and I I don't know how much Tony would like that, uh, and nor do I think that if you know if Poirier was able to actually set up a kind of you know long shifting combination um and if ferguson is just you know trying to lean out of the way off the back foot then that could also lead to some very very bad things i mean you you have to you have to think that that could also a fight like ferguson poirier could also go south very very quickly for ferguson right i think there are two things there that would combo really well somebody confident enough to jab when Tony's jabbing, like almost that Ken Norton approach to Ali, like jab with a jabber, jab with a jabber, and just do yep. that all day. And then somebody that could combine that with the confidence when Tony gets closer to just duck inside and come up with something for him, like something for his body, try and punctuate body shots at the end of exchanges. That's kind of why, like, I'm excited about Gaethje's willingness to use his jab more, and, and it's still a bit primitive, but to be more educated in initiating with it and disrupting people's flow with it. Because I feel like if, if a Gaethje comes out and he's like, oh, you want to infight? Well, I don't feel like infighting for the next 15 seconds, so I'm just going to trade jabs with you. That causes Tony all kinds of grief, and I think that gives um, Bib a really bad time too. And then if we get into the clinch or infighting exchanges, looking to punctuate the end of that with shots to the body, or even threats of shots to the body, for me, that's where you start sapping the energy of Tony Ferguson. Because one thing that is worth noting is, is because Tony's um, attritional warfare has been so successful, we haven't seen what he does when the other guy isn't getting tired. We've seen Max bite down on leather and make very competitive rounds against top-level opponents when he knows the other guy's not going to be tired, can go five rounds, or at least can offer a threat throughout five rounds. We've seen Max in two fights on that. We haven't seen Tony, because I think that's a, it's a quality with attritional or pressure-based fighters that isn't talked about enough. It's one of the reasons why I probably walked away from the Ray's Jones fight with a, a surprisingly high appreciation of Ray's. He was fucking exhausted by the end of the fourth round, but he was still throwing, he was still carrying out a plan. He understood Jones wasn't going to break, and he still had something to offer, and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't giving up. We haven't seen Tony in that position, and I'm not necessarily saying I think he will fail. It's more... It's a big question mark against a guy like Khabib who can go five rounds if it's his fight. Yeah, I think there are a couple matchups that we haven't talked about yet that might be interesting given a couple things mentioned already. 
And one of them is it kind of brings up Tony's one thing that we haven't really mentioned about Tony yet, which is that his form kind of varies across fights. And that matchup is Eddie Alvarez. As Danny mentioned, Tony uh, isn't particularly comfortable against guys who can like roll underneath his shots. And if we look at the Venata fight as that, I think it makes an Eddie Alvarez fight surprisingly binary because Eddie Alvarez enjoys the kind of swarming pressure fighter, enjoys facing that kind of fighter. But also, if you look at the Dos Anjos fight, a lot of Tony Ferguson's approach was based on RDA not being particularly comfortable with someone longer than him who can push him back and deal the kind of damage from the outside that RDA can't necessarily lash back against. And that's something that Eddie Alvarez has struggled in the past, too. Uh, longer fighters who can counter him on the way in and not really give him the pocket boxing approach that he wants. So I think that's an interesting matchup to look at in terms of both of those weaknesses. And it's something that you mentioned before the podcast, uh, Hacks, is that a lot of Tony Ferguson's approach is based on the word maybe, or a lot of Tony Ferguson, you know, um, predictions are based on, you know, maybe he does this, maybe he shows up like this, maybe he shows up like that. And, you know, if you look at, like, Tony Ferguson showing up like he did against RDA, Against Eddie, I think you could reasonably argue that's a pretty bad matchup for Eddie Alvarez. But then you could see him struggling against Lando Venata, rolling underneath things until he figured out a solution against a guy who's better defensively than Venata, more consistent defensively. And you could say, you know, maybe Tony just gets hit hard and doesn't recover. Now, the other matchup that I wanted to discuss was someone who could take away the jab. Now, we mentioned someone who could jab with him, but... The best jab counterer at lightweight, I would argue, might be Abdulaziz Abdulvakabov at ACA, who built his approach around the cross counter. And I think that could also be a way to take away Tony Ferguson's comfort zone, because as you mentioned, one of Ferguson's best approaches on the feet is just flustering guys with the jab, you know, just throwing it out in volume. And I think the problem with giving so many opportunities to someone who can has a really powerful, consistent cross counter It could get Tony, even after he gets out of that initial slow zone, take away his primary tool. And I'm not sure how Tony's going to deal with that. I I, I would love both of those fights. I think the thing about AAA and Eddie that maybe people haven't focused on as much because they're too busy downplaying Eddie and shilling really hard for AAA, I think they're very instructive fighters. Uh, How you fight against AAA and Eddie tells me a lot about who you are as a fighter and how you chain things together because they are very difficult to just beat clearly in one area of the game yeah Uh, so i mean ferguson is a he is a smart fighter like i don't want to make it out to seem like he's he's dumb he's a he is a smart fighter um he understands kind of like the basics of style matchups he knows you know he did a better job of cutting anthony pettis off he found on the right slice of range against RDA where he could consistently push him back and RDA's counters would largely fall short. Like he, he did a good job breaking rhythm on the feet against Kevin Lee. Um, Barbosa, he just kind of bum rushed him because he knows Barbosa, Barbosa would kind of crumble against that kind of approach. I think he's like, like Ferguson is not a dumb fighter. Um, it's just that he does sense, need to take a little bit of time to build his own fight. Um, I don't actually, I don't know if Alvarez is, a fast enough starter to to really like hurt Ferguson early. I mean, he might be. Um, I do like in, you know in, in more recent years, Alvarez has shown more of a propensity for hitting the body. Um, I've always loved Eddie's cage craft and his ability to draw guys in. Um, but and then you know AAA is a difficult guy to to push onto the back foot like he's a difficult guy to kind of back down um but what do you see from these specific fights for him like what was it like what is it about like alvarez that could you know do you think alvarez could actually get him out of there uh i mean it's hard that's one thing about ferguson it's it's hard to see people beating him in decisions without seriously limiting volume and it's hard to see people limiting volume against this iteration of ferguson without hurting him badly enough to maybe get a finish because as we've seen against Tony, he's gotten hurt a bunch against Venata, against Pettis, and he's not going to stop unless you, you know, put him on the brink of death. Unless you beat him to within an inch of his life, he's going to keep doing what he does. And what he does is pretty conducive to winning decisions. So I think if I'm picking Eddie, it's going to be by finish. It's just I'm not particularly sure whether I pick Eddie, depending on, again, the maybe of what Ferguson does. 
Because I think what I see about Eddie is that he kind of beasts Tony on the inside in terms of, you know, just pure exchanging. Uh, Tony's going to have trouble doing what he did to Pettis and, just, you know, getting him squared up against the fence and just going off because cutting Eddie off is a pretty Herculean task for even really, really strong conventional pressures. So I think if Tony wants to, like, stand Eddie still against the fence and just, like, go off with elbows and jabs and kicks, that's going to be hard to do. And Tony, and Eddie's going to kind of lash back with those body combinations, play with his guard a bit. It's going to be hard if Tony takes that approach. And the approach that I expect Tony to take with a camp that's smart, and Tony, as you mentioned, is pretty smart, he's just weird, is to do the kind of thing where he finds the place where Eddie can't really do things, um, you know, the where Eddie's counters are kind of shorter and where Eddie's has to cover distance a bit and play on the counter a bit until he can figure that out. Uh, with Triple A, yeah, I think Triple A is kind of a uniquely awful matchup for Tony, if I'm being honest, because one, you have the jab countering, which is really, really hard for Tony to deal with, I'd suspect, because as I mentioned, a lot of Tony's game after, even after he starts up a little bit and like, you know, he has to like rev up through the first round, is that he flusters guys with the jab, but Abdul Bakabov has um, not just one, but multiple specific responses to guys trying to jab him. And we saw them, that in the first Vartanian fight, where, you know, Vartanian, he got his lead leg kick, so he couldn't really do much uh, with putting his weight there. He got 3 2 on the counter. He got cross-countered, like, four times in, like, two minutes. So that's going to be hard. And the second thing, as you mentioned, is the fast starting, because Abdul Bakabov, he is a real, real power puncher. And I think that's also what gives me some concern with Gaethje, is that he goes forward and he gets right after it. And I wouldn't be surprised if Tony just got caught cold in one of these fights. That's one thing. Tony's approach, it works objectively. It's very, very strong. But I also wouldn't be shocked if someone just bum-rushed him and got him out of there. Within reason, of course. Now that I'm thinking about it a bit more, because it has been a while since I watched Triple A vs. Bagov, but was it round two, the exchanges after 4.30? Like... AAA was just killing him on the fence oh, with yeah. the uh, wrist straight beautiful. to the body. Yeah, uh, like he he's comfortable building off the the body straight to hit the hit the body hit the head with the left hand. Um, obviously he does have the cross counter, which you know I probably should talk more about. The specter of my boxing coach is going to hit me in the head. Um, yeah, no, I I think that type of approach. Yeah, Triple A probably kills Tony real bad. I, I think the other thing that I'd add is. Um, one thing that makes me feel comfortable that Triple A can hit good body attacks from breaks and clinches is Triple A, uh, a is so comfortable tying the wrist up. Like he's he's so comfortable at transitioning that into meaningful attacks at the end of transitions. And yeah, oh, I, I think he'd he'd hit Tony's body all day. But I mean, as I said, I think Triple A and Eddie are such interesting fighters because you cannot beat them without showing something fundamentally interesting about how you approach MMA. I would love to see Triple A against like all the fighters in lightweight. I think some might beat him, but you would learn so much. And I, yeah, I think he does, Tony. To be honest. Yeah, I think I probably agree with that one. And I also, I, I do want to highlight something that was mentioned a little bit earlier because it's an interesting kind of thought thought train to go on. Is that um. The notion of limiting exchanges, like how how would Ferguson do against someone? You know, is, is there anyone at lightweight who could play like a kind of leg kick jab pivot out fighting game who could just you know if if, if every time t Tony wants to step in they're able to just angle out they don't just back themselves into the fence they're able to like you know jab him say really hard in return when he wants to jab. Um, hand fight with him. Like, is there anybody that we can think of that would actually be, like, is someone who could just limit exchanges? They don't have to necessarily exceed his pace, but how would someone like, you know, Vartanian play? Like, because I think, I think that's a that's an interesting matchup to me. Just thinking about it. What do you guys think? Yeah, I agree. I think, like, almost by definition, someone who can just outfight the way Vartanian can, just he's absolutely gorgeous at that, it's going to be tough for Tony to get his primary process going. Uh, one thing that we haven't really talked about in this, I don't think we've talked about it at all, honestly, is uh, Tony's grappling, which is that he's not much of a takedown defense kind of guy. He's more of a get taken down and play guard type of fighter. 
you know, he has those nice elbows from guard. He has a pretty robust array of submissions from down there. But I do struggle to think how he does against a strong top player like Vartanian, to some extent, someone who can reliably mix takedowns into a striking, someone who's about as versatile as him from both stances, who can um, out-jab him. That's Vartanian as well. So, yeah, I think Vartanian's interesting. But, you know, there's also the question of Vartanian against, like, a really fast starter since... Uh, both Bagov and Triple A got him that way. So, yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting fight. He lost the first round against AAA in their first in their second fight, excuse me. And I think I think I scored the fifth round for Triple A too. I think I, I think I gave Vartanian the the middle three. But yeah, he is he's another guy who also tends to need to get a little bit get a little bit of momentum going and start fig- start getting his reads before he's able to really you know put together a consistent fight pattern. Hax, what do you think? I think that the thing with that matchup is Tony builds slowly because Tony builds slowly. Like, like I know that sounds like a tautology, but it's kind of true. Um, I, I would love to see what Tony could accomplish before Vartanian starts getting his reads in. And I think that first round is going to tell us a lot about that fight. If Tony is able to make Vartanian think, this, this is my fight now. I am the captain now. This is mine. Um, we're going to have to see Vartanian go to a lot more than just controlling the fight with his outfighting, with his jab, with his reactions, because Tony's going to be everywhere. He's going to be like, you know, confusion jitsu. Like, just every... Um, but it, it, <laughs> if, if that first round ends and Vartanian's like, I've got the measure of you, I, I don't know if he finishes Tony. I don't even know if he dominates Tony, but I think he kind of just, not in a literal sense, but in a metaphorical sense, he just manhandles that fight. You know, Tony will have periods of whirling offense, but Vartanian will just smack him on the end. Like, he will find a way to make it look like he's winning every meaningful exchange. He, You know, he's such a defensively-minded fighter, I can't see Tony, you know, stringing together enough damage to his will or his body. Like, it just feels like he controls that fight if Tony doesn't impose his will on it by the first round. Yeah. I think that's one thing that we haven't really noted. We haven't really noted about Tony past mentioning the Gaethje fight is that it's one thing to kind of have the technical acumen to deal with Tony early, but you also kind of need if it's like an even remotely close fight, you all, you also kind of need that same kind of unbreakable will unless you just get him out, which is kind of crazy to think about because there aren't many fighters with that. As I mentioned. Even if Tony's like on the verge of death, he's going to keep coming, and that's like it's it's a weird commentator thing to put a ton of emphasis on, but it is what carries Tony's game through past all of the defensive problems and past all the offensive idiosyncrasies. It's just the the man won't stop, and that's why I think that's another reason why I think Triple A might be a bad matchup is because through the bag off fights he was similarly unstoppable. Where I think if you give someone like Ali Bagov, even if he has like the wrestling advantage early, if he's going to gas and maybe like you know that kind of thing, even a bad matchup for Tony can turn into a good one just based on mental strength. So I, I think this is worth saying. Um, maybe is the kind of the final segment of this discussion because it's it, it's a useful one to think about. Maybe not a particularly happy note to end on, um, but. How much has Tony, like, Tony has been kind of blackballed by the UFC. It, it needs to be said. He's been, they did him dirty. Uh, how much, like, has Tony's run, like, how much has it taken out of him? And, you know, now is the, you know, after seeing that Cerrone fight, which was pretty odd, you know, in, in the nicest of terms, um... How do we evaluate Tony going forward? Like, if he's, you know, if he's matched up with, like, you know, say, Dustin Poirier, and then he gets Justin Gaethje, and then he gets, I mean, I don't know, Charles Oliveira. Like, how does he go forward? Because it's, I'm starting to wonder if his ability to, to leverage that pace is has been somewhat magnified by the fact that he's been fighting somewhat like if not eroded then just kind of pace you know quote unquote like pace vulnerable fighters like Kevin Lee uh like Venata, Anthony Pettis, Donald Cerrone um it just leaves me feeling a little bit 
like a little bit uneasy. I mean, his last fight was almost a year ago, and it was a pretty strange one with Donald Cerrone. I mean, like now, I guess the question is for Tony Ferguson is like, now what? So obviously the fight on everyone's mind is Khabib Nurmagomedov, and obviously because he's earned that shot. But I think it's kind of hard for me to see the Khabib fight going well. And I hope Hacks can disabuse me of this notion because I really want Tony to win that. But it's one where I feel like Tony really needs to bank early rounds because Khabib has, it, it's less energy intensive for Nemegomedov to hold you down than it is for the other person to get up, which is, it's kind of the definition of like a good top player, but it's what Khabib does. And I feel like Tony would really need to, at the very least, not run out of time at the end is he'd need early rounds, and I can't really trust him to do that after the Cerrone fight. As for those other fights, I think we've kind of captured the dynamic of Poirier and Gaethje well. Oliveira is kind of a reverse Tony in terms of match flow, where, you know, he can start super strong, but you still have the specter of him falling apart mentally against guys like Paul Felder and, you know, getting uh, beat up by a bunch of guys who he maybe shouldn't have lost to. It's just, that's a weird fight, and... I want to trust Tony more than I should because, as I said, he's a very good fighter. He's just built weird. It's just that the weirdness of his build, I don't expect it to age well because a lot of it's based on him just being, you know, not only mentally unbreakable, but physically very, very resilient. Not necessarily like, you know, iron chin, but he can take a shot. He's taken a couple shots. So if that goes away, I'm not sure where he goes. I think Tony's style is probably the example of it works until it doesn't. Like, yeah. it, when it's going to fail, it's going to fail badly. I mean, this is probably the other thing that attracted me to kind of studying Tony Ferguson. He's a beautiful example, if you want to, like, write for an ethics journal or a, or a law journal about how the UFC is a joke of an organization and will just abuse the shit out of its fighters. The yeah. fact that his prime has been wasted away on inconclusive title rematches, the fact that he has taken some pretty horrific injuries... The fact that he has very severe and often maligned and mocked mental health issues, and yet the UFC keeps using him as a go out there and bleed for us, Tiny. You know, Tony, you you are the Mexican god of violence. Go and make the plebs be happy because everybody's bleeding when you're in there. Um, I don't really know about the Khabib fight. I've always said I, I feel way less confident than any of you guys do calling it because Tony is the definition of a fighter who fights to the level of his opponent, and he clearly can strategize. And on one hand, he's whirling violence, the fact that he always asks so many questions, his willingness to do crazy shit, and the fact that he will not let you back him to the fence. You have to force him to back up. Those are all questions where... Um, in theory, they're good ways to screw with Khabib, but he could just as easily throw a round away by doing something stupid and just get pounded out. I, I think I don't feel comfortable calling those those fights other than the uh, Oliveira one, which I, I do think he, he wears Oliveira down. What I do feel comfortable saying is that Tony is probably the closest thing mixed martial arts has to the... Um, and I don't quite like this ter term, but it is, it's a good term to get your point across, the mad artist. He... Um, he, I think, has burned a lot of his prime on fights where he should have been fighting for the title. Obviously, nobody can blame um, the was it you know perhaps the fifth three schedule. And I think at this point, if we have a sixth three schedule, there could be a fight. There'll be an alien invasion because like you know, COVID clearly <laughs> happened to stop that fight. Um, but I, I almost feel uncomfortable talking about Tony in fight by fight terms because. Every time we think we understand him, we don't. And every time we say he can't keep getting away with it, he does. I know he'll break. I know he will eventually snap, especially if, like, he fought somebody like Yan who got on the horse pit and went up to a high division or suddenly became, you know, 10 kilos heavier and just smashed him. I know that he's going to lose. I know that everything you guys are saying about concerns for his chin and his mental health and toughness are legitimate. But I just don't feel comfortable saying where that ending's going to um, happen. I think he's a fighter's fighter. I think a lot of fighters will rate him higher than almost anyone, even the analysts. And especially at this point in his career where we have just weird fights, like the Cerrone fight where Tony seemed happy getting hit and then just decided, fuck it, I'm going to kill him. Um, I'm just kind of happy to sit back and enjoy it. Like Tony Ferguson is kind of my guilty pleasure. He's everything a fighter shouldn't be, but he keeps winning. Um, I would say that... 
the problem with Tony is every fight we get on that isn't a championship level fight against somebody as good as Khabib Geishi is another fight where he makes more damage and is, it takes more damage and is another fight where we don't get the full picture. I hope he doesn't take any replacement fights. I hope he pushes for a title fight. And if he doesn't get a title fight, well, I don't really know where to go from here. Yeah, I think you. I think you pretty much summed it up. Um, I mean, he is. I think as Phil McKenzie called him, he is the forgotten MMA great. Like he is the he is the great lightweight that the UFC forgot for whatever reason. Um, I mean, he has. Uh, you know, while there may be some of these wins may not have aged that well, this is still a, a frightening run to to take. There are not many lightweights that I can think of that could go through the same run of fighters and come out, you know, come out having won all of them. You know, even even going back as far as like Danny Castillo and like Josh Thompson, like these are these are you know lower level wins, but they're still you know pretty pretty consummate performances in there where you can see, you know, glimpses of the fighter that Tony Ferguson is going to become. Um, but I, like, there is a little bit of sadness in, in Tony Ferguson in his career because he has been jerked around by the UFC. They've, they have clearly not taken him that seriously. Um, I don't, you know, the, the getting stripped of the title after the Kevin Lee fight is still just one of the most mind-boggling decisions that I can think of in modern MMA. Like, I, I, I still don't know what the rationale behind that was. Um, and, you know, if there's such thing as deserve, you know, Tony Ferguson does not deserve another unranked fight. He deserves, he deserves to fight for the title. Um, but the cynic in me kind of feels like maybe they've missed the boat. Like, maybe, maybe the UFC is just... Like, I, I don't know, maybe they match him with Gaethje in the UFC's, or, you know, or Poirier, and they're just really trying to get him out of contention. Like, I don't, I it's, it's hard to say, you know, if they, we didn't even talk about a potential fight with Conor McGregor, but like, that's, you know, even that's a, there's a serious risk there too. Like, that's not, if they, you know, if they remake, you know, the main event for 49 and they go Tony Ferguson and, and Conor McGregor at 155, is it a winnable fight for Tony? Sure. Is it a fight where he's almost certainly going to absorb a lot more damage? And, you know, does he have a serious risk of getting finished and losing all of his momentum? Absolutely. Uh, and that's just that's just an unfortunate place to be for any fighter. Um, Surin, what do you think? Yeah, I think one thing that makes Tony's win streak a bit more impressive is this. Is, there's a great deal of variance just inherent in MMA, and that's something that people have mentioned, you know, it's like any given night, oh, anyone can win or lose. But, like, for example, if you look at someone like George St. Pierre, who was the most controlling, kind of dominating fighter we've seen in MMA in a very, very long time, even he got Sarah just totally randomly. And if you look at someone like Tony Ferguson, he doesn't really control that variance. If anything, he maximizes it with his approach, with the way he's built, with all the technical flaws inherent in his game. And yet, since the Michael Johnson fight, where he wasn't really the guy he is now, since that fight, he's done nothing but win. He's surfed on a knife's edge of loss, and he's come out smelling like roses all the way up until the, the Pettis fight, the Cerrone fight. He still won. And that's kind of ridiculous to think about in a way that transcends the, the limitations that we've seen in him. And that, you know, you can say he's struggling against guys he shouldn't struggle with. You can say he's not looking great in every moment. You can say he squares up a lot. You can say his jab leaves him vulnerable. But what you can't say is that Tony Ferguson is not a winner. And that's really, really notable in a career that, as you mentioned, the UFC hasn't done a great job nurturing or fostering. And the UFC never does that. But with Tony, it's very, very apparent. That's such a an accurate summary of Tony for me because it's so strange that the UFC is kind of still a uniquely American media, right? Like they all, they, you know, oh, you can't speak English in a, in a way that creates drama. Get the fuck out of, we don't want you as the champion. He's a guy who's been on a ridiculous win streak in the, 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 uh, the division where going on a long win streak in itself, regardless of who you're beating, does actually mean something. He has stepped up and fought top five guys and murked them. He has been wounded and hurt and beaten, and he still finds a way to win. And I'd say, unlike somebody like Habib, who makes everybody fight his fight 
in the sense he controls them. Tony walks into other people's areas of comfort and says, fuck you, this is mine now. Like, Tony is the only guy who has this ridiculous win streak in this ridiculous division doing so in an environment and a way where he doesn't care about the consequences to his body. He has significant mental health problems. He has been sidelined and repeatedly screwed over by the UFC. There's a lot to shape Tony's actual accomplishments as an underdog story. The the great American underdog, not particularly athletic compared to some of the absolute beasts in this division, uh, not particularly technical, but with an intuitive understanding of how to win, and it seems like an unbreakable will. And yet nobody views him that way. He is, ha-ha, Tony, meme man, he say funny, do thing, ha-ha-ha, or, you know, how dare you reflect on him as anything other than a tragic figure with mental illness. Like, he, he gets these responses and these tropes that are so divorced from the reality of what he's actually done. And it's like, I, I hope 10 years down the track history is a little bit kinder to him we stop making jokes about his weirdness and downplaying like oh he got rocked in this one fight and we actually appreciate how absurd his win streak is and the division that he's in um and that's kind of maybe the biggest irony of, of tony i was I was talking to a friend about this and he made the very apt observation uh tony is the guy that we all use technical analysis to kind of downplay his accomplishments right but when we look at his career, everybody ignores the technical accomplishments, the wins, the, you know, the, the fact that he keeps winning and we use emotional arguments. And that, like, if that isn't a perfect summary of Tony motherfucking Ferguson, then what is? Like, we can't even be inconsistent, sorry, we can't even be consistent with how we evaluate his damn career. Of course, Tony fucking Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that. Uh, I think that feels like a pretty good note to end on. Um, I think you're right, Hacks. I think over time, Hack, uh, Tony's career is probably going to be one that's looked upon more favorably. And I mean, he is a at a minimum, he is a a top five lightweight of all time. With you know, I'd say with Khabib and and Alvarez and, and a couple of others. Um, but it's you know, it's a it's it's hard to say. And I hope like I hope that. I hope he does beat Khabib. I know it seems unlikely at this point, and probably grasping for straws, but it would be a like a rare moment of genuine triumph in MMA if we could see Tony Ferguson win that fight. Um, but other than that, I guess we'll stay tuned. Nothing's really been rescheduled yet, and I, you know, some you know may not even be rescheduled. So I guess we'll just have to keep our ears open. Nonetheless, hacks. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Uh, thanks for putting up with me. Oh no, absolutely. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> this was a this was an awesome awesome feature and we'd love to have you on the podcast again because this was uh as far as content this was one of the, the most interesting discussions that we've ever had, I'd say. Uh on a sure. on a fascinating uh and undeniably great fighter in MMA. Um so with that, thank you guys for joining us on the Fight Side podcast. Serum and I I think we'll be back next week. What do you what's on our docket, Serum? You you make the pick. I've I've been positing shit for a while. What do you what do you want to talk about next week? Uh, we could do the Whitaker thing. Uh, depends on talk who we Whitaker. get on if we have any plans with another guest. But yeah. yeah, I mean, there's not much going on right now. I think we covered the two really really interesting fighters on 249 with uh, this and Calvin Cater if that happens. So, yeah, uh, next week we fuck around a bit more and try to desperately create the magic we did here with Hacks. That sounds good to me. Thank you, guys, and 